Well, slightly later than planned, a few days, as you know, do this Saturday morning, and it's Monday morning right now, but yeah, A View from the Hazards, episode 12, oh my god, we'll be three figures soon, Ben's here, um, Ben's, Ben's hair's growing, but you can't see it, because I'm not on a video, but um, yeah, Ben's here. It's a dream, it's a dream. Um, you've shaved as well, haven't you? I saw your picture yesterday. What do you mean? You've got, like, no beard. I'm not clean shaven. Oh really? Oh, fair enough. It must no, just no. must oh, have been God, the no. must have been the lighting. Clean shaven with like mop hair would would just be like one step too far. So I'm growing a goatee at the moment. Uh, oh. I did see that yesterday actually when uh, when you joined our group chat. I did I did yeah I did, I know, I did um, see the beginnings of uh, a goatee. I want to look like Juan Sebastian Verón. Um, if Are anyone you knows, shave your head? <laughs> potentially he was a good player and, to be fair. And get and get an earring. Oh my god, and be terrible in England. Um, <laughs> no, um, well, we'll see. I've just, it's been a time for experimentation on eBay as well. I've just been eBay's my new addiction, I think, without realers. You do, you just you found it, haven't you? you I found, found eBay. Oh my found, god. I mean, like it's a new angle for you to buy cheap, cheap gear. Yeah, with no charity shops, eBay's got to be the one. Um, but it's one of those. Any developments in real tennis at all that we've probably not talked about? Um, has anything happened in real time? I saw something on... Uh, Tell you what, we've got a few, go few fucking rival podcasts coming up. Like, Mark Eagle, did you send you that this morning? I was just about to say, I went on Instagram this morning, I saw the TNRA, well, I can't imagine it's the TNRA, but somebody, on behalf of the TNRA, yeah. has, uh, has re... kind of... Oh. Story? What's the, what would that be? Yeah, re it's re Jesus yeah, re Christ. just storied it. Um, Showing my age there. Mark Eagle's doing a live chat about real tennis, all things good and bad. That'd um, be interesting. And obviously we've been invited on this Washington one with Ivan. Oh yeah, on yeah. The, uh, the, the live Zoom call with the Washington members, so that'll be, that'll be fun, I'm looking forward to that. That's on Friday, isn't it? Um, and obviously Cam's doing his stuff, like um, the, the match reviews, I don't think that's a bad idea at all. Um, I mean, you know, when you're trendsetters like we are it's, it's, it should come as no surprise to you that people are yeah i'm not know, even i'm not even kind of worming their way in i like it it's good i'm not being bitter but genuinely people have copied us well with the original investment i know fact it's no surprise now everyone's thinking they're a podcaster but doesn't, doesn't bother me yeah we are the original and best no alpha attitude um <laughs> don't say it um so, no, today's going to be an interesting one. Um, it's a rare one for me, actually, because I've probably come up with the topic a little bit. Um, so I was on Crick Info's Cricket website, and they had this series of articles called Come to Think of It. Basically, a common theory from cricket, for example, one would be our oh, New Zealand are such a nice, well, like, sportsman-like team, um, always play the game fair. And then it's basically like, well, hang on, why does everyone think that, and is it the truth? Um, and as it turns out, in, in years gone by, New Zealand have been far from that. It's just this weird perception everyone's got. And I think that in real tennis, there's a lot of sort of things people just blindly accept if they're new to the game or if they've maybe not been um, around other, other clubs and stuff like that. There's, there's a lot of facts people just accept. And yeah. So what? are we about to turn into Mythbusters? For lack of a better term, yes, we are real tennis mythbusters. Could be. I'm sure there's probably there's probably a copyright on that, so um, I'll, I'll take that back. Intellectual property rights, yeah. Well, real tennis mythbusters, that's one brand. Um, but yeah, Trademark. so I think I think there's a certain thing. So I mean, let's just think, let's just start this discussion off. What things in real tennis would you say are accepted? Like everyone knows, like just says it. I mean, one would for me. I mean, um, well, as in accept like. Um, People say it and it's true, or just... people say it, and I'm not saying this isn't true, but like everyone's like, oh, Drew Lyons is the best marker in the world, and yeah, it just rolls off the tongue. It just right? rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? But or, or it's one of those things where if you turn around and say who's the best marker in the world, you're you just you don't even think about it. You're just going Andrew Pines. But it's yeah. the default answer. It's the default answer. And I'm not saying it's wrong, but I'm just saying like maybe we should think about why people say that, and should we think twice before saying Drew? Um, just because because of the way people just bang, just go say true. Do you know what I mean? So is that your is th is this your first topic? Uh, I'm gonna open up with that one. Yeah. So why do All we right. why do we think that this um, this conventional theory of Drew being the best mark of the world is there? It's quite a basic one. Um. Well, uh, it's as you say, it's just kind of widely accepted because that's the norm. You know, like yeah. if you if you go out there and you see. A British Open final or a World Championship or something like that. You you 
you associate like Andrew Lyons marking Andrew Lyons with the World Championship as much as you associate Rob Fay with the World Championship. Right? It's actually so true. It's like um, oh, I'm trying to think of it. It's, you know, in Wimbledon, there's always that guy in the box with the hat. Brazil, Brazilian guy. Yeah, he's know what he is. Yeah, he's always there. Um, you associate him with Wimbledon. He's called, he's, he's called the umpire, mate. Oh no no no! Not the umpire. Like he's in the players' oh. box. The guy with the hat. Oh, right. Do you know that guy? Oh, right. Okay. Uh, I don't know. Then. I don't but um, no no. Um, but I think for a lot of people, and we do have a lot of like um, listeners throughout the game uh, who might not know much about Drew Lyons or whatever. But I think yeah, he does all the big games. He's just there. So here's the thing, right? If we exp- oh, right, so let's ex- let's explore a good marker. Yeah, or or not so a good marker. Let's explore like the roles of a marker. Yeah. Right. So, what are you looking for? Um, consistency. Right. That's that's going to be the big thing, right? Yeah. If I'm being, if somebody's marking me, and they are a yard out with their chase calling, for example. Yeah. Um, you kind of go, oh well, and then, but once it happens like third time in a row, if as long as they're consistently a yard out in the same direction every time. You can get on with that, right? Hundred percent. Yeah, okay. Don't get me wrong. So that feel, you then kind of say like, obviously, another important thing is accuracy. And if someone's a yard out every time, they're not being very accurate. No. But if they if they are consistently, you know, if they're consistent with what they're doing, yeah. Whether you think it's right or correct or accurate or not, you can kind of get on with it. Yeah, yeah. And I tell you what, there is nothing more consistent. In the real tennis world, than a better than two call from Andrew Lyons. I knew you were going to say that as well. Um, <laughs> and he does a lot of stuff which is like four and five, three and four, um, because obviously, like you'd rather that in the middle than you would, let's say, half a yard better or worse. Well, that's what I mean about like so so consistency. So if you got so, would you say that Andrew Lyons is consistent? Yeah, very consistent. Right. So he ticks a pretty big box there, right? Yeah. Which I, I would agree with. Um, I think. First and foremost, it's strange because consistency is absolutely like the most important thing. However, you don't really get to um, like analysing somebody's consistency before they've got over the accuracy hurdle. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. If, if you've got someone marking for you that's just literally blind, um, you're not going to think like, oh yeah, they were, at least you know they were consistent because you would be like, they don't know what they're doing or. Or whatever it is, do you know what I mean? So, yeah, yeah. in order to be talked about in a consistent manner, you've got to get through a few. You've got to jump over a few hurdles first. Like you've got to be accurate. Um, so, obviously, Andrew Lyons does all of his marking from the net. Um, his yeah, fault calling on like his his fault calling on the fault line above his head, which he's blind to see. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he's blind from is exceptionally consistent and very accurate. Yeah, yeah, he's good. He's good. So that's that. That instills like confidence in a player straight away. It's weird, isn't it? It's like having a goalkeeper. So you talk about a lot of good teams have always had a good goalkeeper because the defense are just a bit more confident. I think you'd play better if the marker like you can just don't have to worry about it. I personally never have never ever touch wood had a bad marking experience, so I never really worry about it. But I can imagine it would like really get to you. Yeah, I mean, it, you know. It, it, it can obviously irk you. Like it's the same thing with anything. You don't, you don't want to make excuses. But if if someone's just having a bit of a nightmare, and you're kind of like, well, you know, I'm, I'm doing the best I can here, and I'm being a bit let down, and my opponent's being let down as well. Like you know, the match is being a bit let down by um, like an external yeah. factor. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but I mean, obviously. Um, the standard of marking is generally very good. You've you've you know just said there that you've never really had a bad one, bad experience, which is good. No, like no, I obviously no. have, but um, but at the same time, obviously being in the luxurious position of playing at the kind of the the high level, um, you know, it's the same as anything. You you, you you don't just get someone thrown out there. Do you know what I mean? No, no. Um. So, so who do we think? Um, obviously, we're not going to spend ages on this, but like, who do we think that, let's say, if Drew was to be challenged? Should I say, can I just say, by the way, go on. I think one of the things that, like, so for me personally, and this might sound a bit like rude, and I don't mean it rudely at all, I think that people just go, Drew's the best marker in the world because he does everything. But that yeah, yeah, it's doesn't true. mean he's the best. It means I mean? that he's I'm, got the most respect. Yeah, I, I, can think of, I can think of people that I think have marked like who who 
maybe Mark likes chases a bit more accurately than Drew. But one thing you have to have if you're going to get out there um, and Mark like world championships and British Open finals and stuff, you have to have a set of bollocks on you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because if you've got like, you know, it's, it's a big it's a big match. And if you've got like two people out there, like if you, for all you know, there's going to be two people out there and for whatever reason, there's going to be a bit of nag and it's going to turn into one of those matches where you've got to step in and do a bit more than just call the score out. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, that's and that takes balls. Andrew Lyons just... I don't want to say has no fear because that's not right. You know, he actually enjoys doing it, and that's that is portrayed out there when he's doing it. So he doesn't just he just doesn't give a shit if someone's like, "Oh, fucking hell, Drew, come on." He's just like, "I don't care. Like, I'm out, I'm not I'm not worried. Like, I'm I'm out here because I want to be out here and I enjoy doing this." So yeah, exactly. Um, so if you enjoy it, you're more likely to do a better job. I completely agree. Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, he's, but I mean, he's yeah, sick. I'd put it this way. Put it this way, I think um, Drew's been a great marker over the years and still is a very good marker. When if someone says, oh, is he the best? Put it this way, if if somebody said to me, Adam Phillips is marking your match today, I wouldn't be in the slightest bit like, oh, well, it's not Drew. You know what I mean? I can yeah, think of loads of, good. People that I'm, loads of people that I'm happy to mark for me. So. Mate, Mark Ryan's good. Mark Ryan's so Mark those Ryan's Lords guys, good. Those Lords guys are well good at marking. So good. Neil um, McKenzie's very good. Uh, I'm just literally rolling names off the top. Like, do you know what I mean? If any, yeah. if I was playing in the British Open final, dream on. Um, if any of those people stepped out into the markers box or sat into the sat in the dead to mark for me, I'd be more than happy. Darren yeah. Long, good marker. Does is he? Yeah, yeah. didn't He's know decent, that. Yeah. Good. Um, and again, Darren's happy to just put himself out there and, and do it. He doesn't care. Yes, yeah, to be fair, Daz literally. He's probably just thinking about the money. Hundred percent thinking about the money. Yes. But, um, that's but do you know what I mean? It doesn't matter. It, yeah. We'll put it this way, whatever your motivation is, and if you're going to put yourself out there for like for finals and stuff like that, there's got to be a financial incentive. Yeah. Then you've got to be like financially motivated a bit. But it's quite simple. If you get out there and you get paid the big bucks to mark a British Open final and you do a horrific job, you're not doing it again. So. <laughs> no. Yeah, I mean? you, it's quite like, true. The, the way to make money out of marking is to be good at it and concentrate and be good at it, so you get asked to do it again. That's true. Yeah, that is true. So, I think first myth buster is Andrew Lyons the, the best marker in the world? He's he is one of the group of people that I would be happy to mark for. Me. I don't I don't I don't think to myself like oh he's head and shoulders above everyone else. Yeah, impossible, he's not no. Better than ever, anyone else. I don't think you can be. I, don't, I actually don't think you can be. I think everyone's going to get calls wrong in real tennis because it's so like tough. There is a big group of people, a very big group of people that are very good at marking. He is one of them. He is just the person we see out there doing the world championships. Does it mean yeah. he's the best? I don't know. Um, but I don't think anyone's ever disappointed in his performance or anything like that so no, he's so definitely up he's yeah he's one of he's obviously one of the best so yeah there's a good first bit of conventional wisdom so i i've actually got another one for you so i suppose so i actually asked my dad about this because i had this topic a few days ago and i said go on dad what what like conventional theories have you got about real tennis and you think maybe that's not true so he said actually quite interestingly so I say a lot of people say, oh, the players from today are so much fitter and stronger. They'd have just beaten like the guys in the 70s and 80s. They'd have just won. And my dad said, well, you got to think that you, 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 you give the players from past decades our equipment, our shoes, and they'd have just adapted their style of play. People always just say like, oh, nah, now's, now's real tennis is so much better. But then again, they didn't even have to like force and stuff like that. They literally just played with what they had to. So you're actually taking out taking out of the equation potential adaptation well if you think um <clears throat> if you think uh let's assume you've got <clears throat> a plus five handicap today and somebody in 1975 who of exactly the same stance whatever number that was at that point because obviously the handicaps have kind of moved around a little bit yeah let's say you've got two people of equivalent standard but one generation or two generations apart if I if I smash a ball down the middle of the court at you, you back yourself to well, you back yourself to get it over the net or volley it back or whatever. But what, the one thing you do back yourself to do is not get hit by it, right? Yeah. So imagine me doing the same with an older, more frail 
like racket. No disrespect to like Grays, but I can only I can, you have to assume that the rackets have got better. Yeah, they have. In first, you have to. Um, and like gut strings with no tension. And now let me hit that at you. Well, yeah. It's going to be coming even slower. So of course you're going to not get hit by that one. So yes, if you've got someone who's got very good reactions and lightning quick and stuff. You know, smashing the ball around with gut strings back in the day wouldn't have, I can't imagine it would have served much of a purpose. You'd probably just had to cut it around because, like, that's the only way to sort of get any control. Um, yeah, if you've got no power and, like, splatability, yeah. then um, people are good at, you know, volleying and stuff, and then you take 20 miles per hour off the ball, it just makes it easier, right? Exactly. So, therefore, I think this sort of leads to people are like, oh, yeah. Rob's got to be the best player of all time. And yes, he's won like the most World Championships and he's won the most Opens. But like, you, I, ju- I just think that, yeah, he may be. He might be. But you've got to think that those older guys, obviously some of them were like amateurs who just played all day, like Naughty Knox and whatever in America. You've got to think that, I mean, what level could they have got to? It's a generational thing, right? It is, yeah. Who, who's, who, who's better, Messi or Maradona? Oh well, Messi could be. <laughs> well, so you can't answer it, can you? You can't. You cannot answer it. People who try and answer it, I just don't think you can. It's no, just because you... you can argue until the cows come home. Who's? I mean, who's better? Rob or fail Pierre Echevarria? Well, you can only go based on record. If you're going, if, if someone pushed me guns to the head, said Ben, you give me an answer, I'd say well, Rob Fay because he won the most. Yeah. Like you can only go on on facts, right? I never saw Pierre Echevarria hit a backhand. I don't know. Like I've got. You know, he, Pierre Echevarria has not been mentioned in any cyborg chat. So true, and because yet, I don't think there's anyone... Yet, there's like, no, there's... Because, because who out there can give us the information? And with the equipment and all that kind of stuff, and the fact that, you know, he would have been running around... Like, Rob's out there running around in, like, a pair of, like, technolo- like technologically advanced, like, engineered shoe, and Pierre Echevarria would have been running around in a pair of brogues. Yeah, he was wearing a top hat. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's completely different. So, yeah. I'm sure Edgebaster was class, but also the amount of people playing, like, no you way. know, Rob, Rob's, like, Rob's beaten Camden in a few world championships. Uh, you know, Tim Chisholm, like, one of the best players ever, like, never lost a world championship. He's, he's like, seen people come along and he's knocked them back. Yeah. I don't know, because I wasn't alive. You know, I, I don't know how, I don't know how deep... British Open draws went in, you know, the thirties. But yeah, just about four. But but it was like, got, like I bet know, it, I, I bet it was, I bet it was like the forty to forty fives in the British Open. So you had like the first round was just a load of forties, and then like, oh shit, Lord Aberdare's in there. Um, yeah. I think one thing, I think one thing that you can you can say, which is going to be, which probably is true, again because of like advances in science and stuff like that. The current crop of players have to be the fittest players ever. I think so, yeah. They have to be because all of the like strength and conditioning training and all I this do kind of think stuff, that, yeah. like the, the knowledge and the science involved now is so far advanced from what it was thirty years ago. So, okay, Howard Angus used you know used to like tell me he's like oh yeah you know I used to do like a hundred court shuttles on the squash court. Well, you'd never get anyone doing that now, mate. I think potentially back in the day they were just as fit. Fit, not I'm as sure. strong. They were, they were. Yeah, I'm, I'm not saying that for one second. But you know, like yeah, yeah. in terms of like strength and power. If you if you took like Chris Ronaldson at his peak and put him up against Rob Fate at his peak and just put them literally in in a lab and said, right, you need, we're going to measure like your VO2 max, your you know top running speed, your endur- and literally scientifically like metabolically test the two of them you yeah. would have to assume that the modern day person is is stronger, better yeah, okay so obviously real tennis is not as advanced and people don't take it seriously but look at like the world record times for like the 100 meters or whatever yeah they're only getting faster because people you know people are able to eke out that extra one percent in science mate bit of trivia for you about 100 meters so do you know how much linford christie was benching at his peak Well, what were we talking about? One rep max? Yeah, one rep. Well, no, he was benching for reps. For reps. Well, how many reps? Oh, Why is it just... Fuck, I don't know. Well, I mean, like, again, you can't... What kind uh, so of I, I, heard it qu- I heard it quoted on a podcast that he was benching this number. That of, t- of, of reps or... Um, let's assume one rep max, because he's a sprinter. All right. 
140. Yeah, 160. I was yeah. like, mate, <laughs> that's it. Obviously, you think sprinters aren't that strong, but yeah, no, they're pretty strong. Well, it's all power. Like, <laughs> yeah, one, one right. max is all power. I'm telling you now, he's not churning out sets of 10 or 10 to 15 <laughs> endurance sets. Yeah, it'd <laughs> be good if he was. Like, fucking hell, Louis Finn. Um, mate, I was listening to the radio the other day, and um, Akin Fenwa was on it. Oh, I love that. And um, they asked him what he could bench, and he's like, oh, my PB's 190. <laughs> That is insane. Yeah, he's he's fucking big though. Imagine him playing realist. The racket would just be too light. He wouldn't be able to do anything. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so yeah, like to try and like bust that myth or whatever. Yeah. I firmly do believe that the modern day player is fitter and stronger and faster and more powerful. But that's because they've had access to much better science. Yeah. So I think to say that Faye would be every other player, we just don't know. However, certainly now they're probably stronger. Um, oh, I think he would. And they play with the best equipment and stuff. Oh, I think he would. Um, and yeah. I, reckon, I reckon if you sat yeah, out yeah. someone like Chris Ronaldson, I reckon he'd be like, yeah, Rob would beat me. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I agree with that. But, you, yeah, you just you, you don't know. But um, perhaps like they would have adapted. But, yeah, let's assume off the bat. That's why. That is why people say, oh, yeah, Rob's the best ever. Yeah, I mean, well, like I said, if you just go based on stats and trophy cabinets the answer is yes every time so if you want to do it on you know immeasurable things like who's the quickest player of all time well without going out there and testing it you can only have an opinion on it right jay gould was pretty quick apparently so olympic gold medalist right <laughs> in the 100 meters um no not really <laughs> um right well i reckon we've got one more myth in us um i actually i've got a few in my head but i don't think i'm going to say them um, well, mate, read them out and we'll just, we, won't, we won't shoot a fat on them. Let's just, let's, let's, right, let's, okay. let's blow this game wide open. Okay, so one thing I've heard so many times, and please, this is just what I've heard. Oh, this isn't what I believe or this isn't what I'm saying. It's wrong. Is if Stout trained, he would he would be, he would have been world champion at real tennis. False. It just gets, people say it all the time. And I'm like, it's not that simple. Like, everyone's like, and all, the, all the racket. People hear that. So I say yeah. false immediately and people will be like, yeah. Oh fucking hell! Like you know, good. I'm, 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 yeah, I'm not saying he's a bad player. Like the guy's absolutely world class, and his talent. I think he's the most naturally talented player I've ever seen play the game. Yeah. I don't think he'd be. I don't think he. I don't think if he traded, he'd be world champion though. That's my opinion. I remember being at Queens loads, and like loads of rackets guys are like, "Mate, where's Stout in this? Like, if Stout trained, surely he'd be world champion." I'm like, "No." Like oh, it's just put, it. Like put it this way, he is. So if people are, oh, you know, cool, Ben, that's a bit rude, blah blah blah. The guy is far more talented than I am far more talented and I would I would never sit here and say I've got more talent than James Stout I'm not even close I don't think he'd be world champion I think it's so hard to be world champion and I think just to well, say I'm, for a few re- I'm not going to go into it yeah, no. like start assassinating a character no, no 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 I've got a few reasons why I don't think he'd be world champion it's a big rack you know there's a lot of there's a lot of people who if someone just threw a name at me, I'd be like, no, they're not going to be world champion. It's you know a, what I mean? Like, it's, a, it's a big myth, yeah. It's rackets, yeah, rackets myth. Well, it's it's the enigma, isn't it? Because he's, he's never tried. And that's why people are like, well, you know, so people love to have that kind of story. Yeah, that's true. You know, like, oh, yeah. because we'll never have the answer, we'll never know, so we're going to say this. Um, and again, it's I'd say it's become this thing in the rackets community where people ask me, like, oh, how's Stout doing at Reelers? And I'm like, well, it doesn't really play. And yeah, it's because it's that enigma and obviously so good at rackets as well, um, it has sort of entered the game as this like, oh, what if? What if? Exactly. And it's the big, oh. what, it's the big what if. Next. Um, so you might see on, on Twitter a lot, Cambridge is the home of tennis. False. Um, I've seen it on Twitter a lot of times. I mean, hopefully Ed Kay's listened to this. He's not been mentioned in the podcast for a while, actually, but... He'd probably say Cambridge is the home of tennis now. All right, so I'm gonna so if so, so I'm gonna fire back with that with two questions. Cambridge is the home of real tennis. A why B prove it. Next. Uh, I think their theory is that there's a lot of pros who've come from Cambridge, a lot of players. Well, all right, well I'm I'm C court it's produced far more. That's a yeah, that's really true. I just yeah, I don't I mean, see how like, Cambridge can be at home. More. And again, I'm, I'm not I'm not having a pop at Cambridge here. But I'm just saying, like, if they if they say, oh, we produce this, I mean, like, don't, don't get me wrong, they produce some serious players. But if you're looking at quantity, Seacourt probably wins that hands down, doesn't it? Yeah, I agree with that. Um, right. Any more? Um, the home of real tennis 
Where is the home of real tennis then? Well, I'd be like, why is it the home of real tennis? It doesn't host any major opens. Like, what? Do you know what I mean? Well, for me, where's the home of cricket? Lords. Right. So the home of tennis, surely, based on the amount of tennis that happens there, has Queens. to be Queens, isn't it? Yeah, I agree with that one. I'd always say Queens is the home of realists. Well, it does um, the British Amateur. It does the British Open. It does like all the all the like public school boys, like all that kind of stuff. Any major tournament, Queens. Yeah, I agree. Um, that's true, actually. Yeah, you're not gonna have the World Cup final for cricket at Durham, are you? Um, no. Um, come on, Robert. You've got one more in your locker here. Um, one more piece of conventional real tennis wisdom. Um, no, I'm I, trying to think of something which is like just the, the most bogus it's, statement. It's annoying because it's annoying because we'll probably like get off get off this podcast and be able to think of loads. But I mean, I think probably now we can open it up to the to people. If if you've got any statements which you think why is why is this like blanket statement a thing um well what's quite interesting is like you know it's just a it's a stature thing so changing it like slightly someone one of my members came in a few months ago and with a racket they were like oh can i get a restring i was like yeah yeah sure and i basically just gave it straight to chris yeah and they i saw them like about 10 minutes later i think i was going on court with them and they were like can you do it i was like why they said, well, could, like, I'd rather you, I'd rather you restrung it. It's not a criticism of Chris at all, yeah, yeah. but it was just the association that, like, I'm the head pro and the better player, therefore I must string the better racket. That's not true. I was like, well, well, no, like, Chris strings my rackets. Like, the racket, the racket I use out there for, like, the British Open semi or whatever, never a final. Yeah. British Open semi, like, Chris would have strung that, do you know what I mean? Yeah, that's true, I said, I said, like, this person is far more experienced in the last 12 months of stringing rackets than I am. Yeah, it's just the you know it's, it's just the the myth busting thing, isn't it? I agree. Oh, you're the better you're the better player, therefore you must be able to do everything better. That's yeah yeah exactly. You must be the better coach. Like oh no, he's he's a better coach because he got to plus five or whatever. Um, it's another, yeah. I think another... I think like there's a lot of people who there's a lot of people who um, I think if you if you if you've never been like a, so in order to like have a very good tactical knowledge of the game i think you do have to have played the game to a high level yeah but if you are a if you're not a high level player you can still be a very good coach providing you can look at the ins and outs of the game do all like the maths and like do all the tactics and stuff in your head and actually be able to translate it to somebody who can do it do you know what i mean it's all very well and good just kind of going well every time the ball comes over to the service and just hit the ball in the grip well that's not possible so dazzle dazzle you, coach that oh no but like do you know what i mean if you if you if you come up with ideas and theories yeah if you then take a step back and go right is it humanly possible to do these things yes i think it is right who out of the current crop do i think could do these things and then you could coach them i think yeah. you've got some credentials but again i think um, yeah like who's the best coach and like why why all the junior stuff's at wellington and again not having a go at wellington but like it seems like every dead in this day is just at Wellington now. It's like Wellington. Yeah, I know it's the newest court, but um, there's no saying that Danny or Ads or anyone who works at Wellington like, is is the best coach, is the best one for developing junior tennis. I think um, anyone could be really. They've got they've got the most experience because they've worked at Seacourt for years. <coughs> yeah. But again, like who's to say they're the best? I'm not saying that. They're both amazing juniors. Yeah. Um, be, again, care- be, like, care- be careful what you say. Yeah, well, no, they're, they're, both, uh, they're both, <laughs> both very good coaches and both are extremely experienced in, like, junior coaching. Yeah. Um, but some of the things that do annoy me, actually, with um, realers, particularly in the UK, because there's so many courts, yeah. is I'm not saying some courts are struggling, but, like, why is it when there's so many things to hand out, like junior coaching days and you know, junior match days yeah. and like British Open qualifiers and stuff like this. Why do they go to clubs that don't need the, the help financially? That's a really good point. Uh, that I would love to, in fact, you could argue it'd be better for a player to go somewhere completely new. Like imagine... So, so, here's, so here's, I'm just, just spouting here, right? Why does the British Open get played at Radley? It's already a very, very busy court, so they have to kind of like crowbar it in. It's a public school, so it's got more money than sense. It doesn't need something like that. That yeah. should be going to, and I'm not going to name any 
clubs because I don't know in every club's financial situation. But if you, you know, the TNRA would know if they if you've got a few clubs that like need a bit of help every now and then or whatever, why don't you go and give them the British Open qualifiers and give them a weekend of court fees? I know it's not much, but like why? Mm. You know, what, why does Radley get it? Why does Wellington, which is like a super super rich school, get all of the like? Mm basically every tournament and junior tournament that's so that's such a good point like why isn't it at, like i mean you could argue it could be at, like middlesex i understand like for convenience and it's mm. a very good location and it's a very good facility and you've got danny and as there i'm not having a crack at anyone or any club or anything like that or any association but it just seems bizarre that yeah like the, you know like the kudos of the clubs it's just yeah. like oh this is like the junior center yeah, so let's, yeah. We're gonna throw everything. It's so there. true. It's so true. I just, just like, I think it's real tennis. It's more than like you can't say a courts like oh yeah, this is where juniors like C court like oh yeah, you go there for junior coaching like anywhere you could play anywhere and be be a good junior. Do you know what I mean? Well, it's let's assume way you've playing. got a, like. Let's assume I'm just gonna let's assume, and it, I know it's not. All right, let's go. Let's go. Let's go somewhere because I don't want people to go. Oh, well, I'm having a crack at my club. Let's go to somewhere where we know that this is a ridiculous statement. Let's say that Lords is struggling financially, which we know is not true. Oh, I thought it was. If you've got like the MCC, which is struggling, and you've got like the British Open qualifiers, why wouldn't the TNRA go? Here you go. We're going to give you this because yeah. I know it's not much, but at least it's a weekend of court fees every year, and you know because it's London, we we'll might be able to generate like a third day or something. Yeah. Why give it to a club that doesn't need the money or the court time? I never thought about it. I think there should be more tournaments or whatever that are given to the sort of the yeah the other clubs. Um, they should spread it around. It's a, at the end of the day, there's 27 in the UK, aren't there? So might as well just make. It. Why doesn't Bristol get anything? Obviously, it's a bit out of the way, but um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I wonder. I wonder how many clubs kind of put their hat in the ring and say like, yeah, let's can we you know can we do something? Newmarket. Imagine that day at the races. Perfect. Um, but yeah, so I think we can wrap this discussion up really. I think there's a lot of things that we just accept as players, as observers, um, as well, people just, we tell, people, just people that play the game. As people we, we explain the game to. And there's a lot of things where you can maybe think twice and think, hmm, is that actually the case? Or why is that the case? And not for one second in this podcast are we like, I think everything we've said, um, I mean, apart from the last few things, we haven't like outright, out, outright thrown out. But um, I think when you do look deeper and scratch beneath the surface, perhaps there are other possibilities um, which aren't mentioned. But yeah, which is well, you can always basically say why, can't you? Yeah, you can. Yeah, it's like okay, well, Cambridge is the home of Royal Tennis. Why? Yeah. Um, James Stout would be world champion if he trained. Why? You, you know, it's, Andrew Lyons is the best mark in the world. Why? If you actually just kind of think about why, you may or may not follow the same thing but it's the blind statement isn't yeah. it without it's the, it's the default response agree without and i think ever anyone who wants to get in touch i feel like a few people will have some suggestions about stuff which is which is like accepted and be really keen to actually hear what you've got to say um if whatever wherever you played however much you played because i think a lot of people yeah could have an opinion on this topic um yeah but yeah so let's move on to the second section which i think um is hide this week we're going to talk about hide we can talk about the Hyde Tennis Club. Now, yeah. what do you know about the Hyde Tennis Club? Um, I've been there twice. So, again, um, went, there on, went there on holiday, went to Bournemouth on holiday, played Hyde. Um, um, and, yeah, what do I know about it? I know it was restored in, like, 97. Shall I give you a bit of history? Um, yeah, because please. Because this you're... is probably the only club in the in the country, apart from Leamington, that I can actually do it. Oh, I'm Hampton Court. I could do a bit of history on. Yeah, go on. Go on. <laughs> tell me. So... Um, the Hyde Tennis Club was purpose built as a real tennis club. Yeah. So it was uh, the Gundry family estate. estate. Yeah, that, so that's there's two right. big, two big families um, in that area at the time: the Gundrys, who are big net makers, yeah. and the Palmers, who are bre uh, like brewers, who are still there. Oh, cool. And the Gundrys are still there. Um, built as a real tennis court for the Gundry estate, um, fell out of use, uh, and. In its before its resurrection in the late nineties, it was um, at one point a roller skating rink. Oh, Jesus. Um, in about nineteen eleven, I think um, it was a, a tank shed for the Americans in World War Two. What? Well, you, so you think of the location, right? You've got the big sweeping like hill that covers three sides of it. Yeah. Perfectly hidden. 
like for oh yeah I mean the Germans got pretty close in the end but yeah um, well yeah as in, you know they, they could they could uh, like burrow down in the in Woolwich <laughs> and do some tank repairs anyway so that's a bit that's a bit of history for you yeah and then like a basically a cow shed for so it was a cow shed recently until they Oh, wow. That was the last thing it was before they. Uh, That's quite cool, but yeah, it is. It's, transformed it. It's, it's similar to a few courts in that it's literally just a court. Do you know what I mean? It's like a changing room. There's a, the court, blah blah. blah. That's yeah, little basically. club room, corn, um, pro shop in the corner, um, beers in the fridge, <laughs> gents and ladies upstairs, yeah. uh, and then the court. That's that's pretty much it. But love like an amazing building. Yeah. Um, an amazing building. Um, when was the last time you went back there? I actually did an exhibition with Neil Mackenzie uh, in the summer. Did you? Last summer. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Did an exhibition, um, which was good fun. Lots of fun. Um, it's got a like a terracotta kind of floor and green walls, which is which is relatively common in real tennis, actually. Yes, yes, you're right. It is it's quite um, a common, quite a common colour scheme. It's quite nice actually. The court it does play well. It plays plays nicely. Um, pretty pretty slow. Um, all things considered, the angle it's quite bouncy. Like it doesn't really cut down that much. No. Similar kind of things I mentioned the other day. The angles are less extreme, um, but yeah, you can get a lot back. The ball seems to slow down when it hits the walls quite a lot. So it's quite an it's quite a it's quite an easy court to play on. So if you're an away player, you know, you're you're not after five after a five and ten minute knock up, you're like, okay, right. Yeah. You know, it's not it's not a great home court to have. One thing I notice is that like when you try and hit a grill off the main wall, it just goes in every single time. So if you noticed, um, the thing about the grill is it's not a square, it's a rectangle. Oh really? It is taller than it is wide, and the reason for that is that um, actually when I work there, um the outside stone is really porous, so wow. it would soak up all the moisture, and it would like get the moisture would like get through in into like into the internal wall in the core, and obviously when it would dry out and stuff, it would crack. So when I was there, the main wall had loads of like really big cracks in it. Wow! And this was like, you know, six years after it had opened. Maybe Adam Phillips was just boasting a lot. Yeah, I probably did a few doubles exhibitions down there, to be fair. Yeah. Um, so they ended up uh, basically building like an internal breeze block wall, um, chucking loads of cement like in behind it, and then like plastering over the top. So there's now an internal wall. So the whole oh, cool. court became, whatever, six inches narrower. Yeah. Um, but the grill and everything was obviously already there. So the grill just became six inches narrower. So that's why it's not a, a, a perfect square. Oh, wow. So what, how did that affect the timbre? Just make it narrower. What was actually interesting about the timbre? Well, no, because if you br if you build like a breeze block wall on the inside of the court, you're going to go down the main wall and around the timbre, right? So oh right, okay. What was interesting about the timbre before that is where the main wall met the timbre, it wasn't a join; it was a curve. So oh, wow. it, so it would literally curve into the timbre. So you, you had to okay. you you had to read either straight timbre, main wall timbre or any random like angle like degree of angle if it hit the curve oh got you got you got you oh my god that's frightening so it was like it was a seriously tough time as a play um and then when they kind of re when they did like the internal wall um they well i say fixed that they changed that so it's now like a uh yeah it's now like a fixed edge now it's a timber. Um, uh what's also interesting about it is you've got the windows down the sides yeah above the outer play line and the first two are in play yeah it's a net isn't it yeah no it's not a net so That's... they've just got a um like a wooden ramp on the windowsill so the ball can go up there and as long as it stays below the play line up there it will just roll back out the window and it's game on game on yeah that's quite cool um so that's interesting um anyway you probably can't remember too much about how it plays it's yeah it's quite uh, slow the pff, walls, are quite no idea. Kind of, walls are quite kind of dead the penthouse is very um very shallow very shallow so oh, yeah. you can like you can ping a railroad in there pretty well it's not as good for high serves because it kind of bounces and skips forward a bit because of the um the shallow penthouse yeah so if you if you want to serve like a good high serve you need a steep penthouse so it hits the penthouse and comes off like as basically as horizontally as it can a shallow penthouse will also encourage the ball to bounce forwards which yeah. makes it much more difficult to get 
to get kind of high flush serves. Oh, cool. Um, very good for demi PKs. You can just slide them in there all day long. Oh, good. Um, but yeah, nice core. The dead on, um, therefore, is a bit wider. Oh, always good. Well, because the same kind of thing as Petworth, because the main wall is now one breeze block and a bit of cement closer yeah. to the middle of the court now. Obviously, the edge of the dead on is still where the edge of the dead on is. Mate, the pet was dead on. Oh my god, that is huge. It's like it's like a genuine football goal. So it's not as it's not as like as extreme as that. But so yeah. the amount of wall from the edge of the dead on to the main wall yeah. is less than the edge of the dead on to the gallery wall on the other side. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does, it does. No, I know yeah. what I mean. Uh, because of the, like, internal breeze block wall that was, that was built. Good trivia, that, Ben. I enjoyed that. So it's quite interesting. There's a few, you know, little local <laughs> local rules to think about. Exactly. Massive crack down the back wall in the return. On the yeah, back it's like the well. way you'd hit a railroad, right? Yeah, exactly. You can yeah, get that thing right. kicking around, which is quite fun. Oh, uh, good. Um, well, no, Hyde's still there. It's, been, it's going strong. What, it must be, like, what, 20... It Very busy. Be, yeah, it's like was 20, 30, 30 years? No, 20. Oh, 20 years, you actually retard. Right, um, <laughs> 1997. Uh, <laughs> I was it's, like, going, it's going very well. It's busy. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's busy. Good good place. The members there are absolutely fantastic as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, like a proper, like, kind of club club I, feel. I think Hyde's produced a lot of players in it, actually. Do you know what's actually quite interesting? Because it's got, yeah, you've, you've got, like, quite a few people that have got better than 10 that have come out of Bridport. So you've got like obviously myself, Neil McKenzie, believe I Gales around there. Um, you never, ne- you never, never got below ten, but he does love the podcast. Uh, well, I'm sure he will get below ten. Yeah, he will, hundred percent. Um, stop trying to just cut the living crap out of every ball, Levi. I did say he listens to every podcast, Ben. Um, yeah, exactly, so I'm giving him a free <laughs> free tip. There we go, free tip. No adverts on this podcast. Um, yeah, Mark Mathias. Yeah, wow. He he liked moving. Um. <laughs> So yeah, there's there's been um, there's been a lot. There's been quite a few few places. It's, it's been an actually un- quite interesting. Yeah, Dor- Dorset has quite a good like representation to be honest. I was like, more, I was more thinking Dorset in general of like obviously well, I was you thinking got, like, of Matt Darren, Ron- Matt like, Ronaldson. Matty, well, and in, well, Ben Spike. Ben Alive and Ronaldson went to Canford School. I'm Spike saying Wilcox, Spike. Spike Wilcox was down there, so like. Oh. Uh, there, there must yeah, be one more player from Canford I can think of from Dorset. Um... Oh, come on, Rob. Um, are, we, are we thinking better than 10 only? Canford. Yeah, I think... Oh, I think there's a guy called Simon de Halpert. But he's I, Seacott. Uh, was he Seacott fair? I think he went to Canford, though. Um, but no, I can't think of anyone. I know that Canford used to win, like, the old boys real tennis every time. Yeah. Because well, Spike... I mean, Spike well, and, it, was, it was like Canford 1 versus Canford 2 in the final. Yeah, because obviously Spike and Matty would have just been ridiculous. Um... <laughs> No, Matty couldn't get in the first team. <laughs> who would Spike play with? I can't remember who it was. Like Spike used to, um God, who was it? No, Matty didn't get in the first team. <laughs> they no, love I'm, that. Not even, I'm not even joking. Like they were stupidly strong. I'm gonna search this now. Um in the Henry Leaf. Yeah, Henry Leaf. Um oh come on. Dive long left here. Right, Henry Leaf Canford. Oh flipping out. Um It'll be on the TNRA website. Right, okay. Quickly, well, anything else? Anything else about... Uh, anything, okay, any... so you've got... Um, how many times have you played Bridport? Just the once? Twice, twice. Twice. So, well, we you put Manchester top five, didn't you? And I put it in, like, seventh or eighth, or in the top third or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, just as a random thing, these things are all going to... I'm very interested to, like, shake these out at the end. Yeah. Um, and, like, see what our... See how we rank them all to play on. Just from our own personal style and yeah and stuff like that. Um, Mate, I've got I've got an absolute belter for you. So oh two God. two players we've not mentioned from Camford. One of That's them. That's what I mean. Spike used to play with like an absolute weapon. Mate, Matt Ronaldson won four. Um, he won four Henry Leafs, but he's got. That was the, like that would there be are, like after after the days of like Spike and stuff. Mate, there are two players uh, like legends who we've not mentioned who went to Camford. Like legends, uh, absolute legends. Well, and um, one of them looks a bit like Aragorn. Who? Aragorn, off Lord of the Rings. Oh God, no! You've, uh, I'm not there. Okay. Um. Well, he's really clever. He's really clever. Um. Is still playing. 
Yeah, I played. I played against. I played against him. I played against him last year, in doubles. Oh, this is going to really annoy me, isn't it? He's older than you. Right. Um, initial. Same as you. Or BTF. B. <laughs> um. You're going to kick yourself so hard because this is so obvious. Well, if it's Ben Ronaldson, I'm not going to be happy because I've already told you Ben Ronaldson. Oh, did you? I thought you said I thought you said uh, Matty and Ivan. No, I said Benny, Ben and Ivan both went. Oh, sorry. Well, it was Ben. And then, right, okay, sorry. That's really bad. And then another one, Peter Patterson went to Camford. Pato, did he? Unless it's another guy called Peter uh, Patterson. I think he used to... I think he used to work there, not go to school there. Could be wrong there. Mate, you won the Henry Leaf. That's what I'm saying. Well, maybe someone from the home of tennis could let, let us know. But yeah, um, this is quite cool. Um, what were we talking about just then? We were talking about something else. We were talking about ranking, where to rank. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, that's, that's a good point. I think for me, I, just because I've only been there twice, um, probably like bottom half. Oh, bro, I was just about to say, if you, if you don't have any real like emotional attachment to it or massive memory of it surely you just basically stick it mid-table and then say it might move at some point bottom yeah half, it's just savage no i mean like 13th or 12th i don't know well that's not bottom half that's mid-table well yeah i meant like mid-table i was like yeah just stick it in the middle <laughs> i love how easily i've, I've twisted you there. you're like all right fine mid-table yeah i know um uh, yeah it's, i just don't really have any attachment i'm, I'm neither here nor oh, there fine. it's fine it's third it's third all right all right <laughs> it's definitely <laughs> no, not obviously, third obviously there's a uh, there's, there's some heartstrings attached to that place for me, so um, it's going to be top third for me. Yeah, would you play a world championship there? Uh, I tried. I've tried to play an eliminator there. Is it? How did that go? Yeah. I spoke to Bridport both times I qualified from the eliminators. Did you? Wow, I didn't yeah. know that. Well, I can't think of anything better than playing a world championship match at like a, a court and a club that like gave me my chance. Do you know what I mean? That's what a, a nice, yeah. what, a, what a nice way to kind of like say thank you. That's like Rooney going back to Everton. Yeah, same amount of hair. Um, yeah. Um, what, why did they say no? They just like we do it. We do it for Mackenzie, not you. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. yeah. Fair enough. Like you were too much of a gobshite. We couldn't get rid. Couldn't wait to get rid of you. Yeah, exactly. Oh, well, um, maybe next time, third time. No, so uh, 2012. I can't really remember why, but. Um, this time around, 2020, they've got an exciting opportunity, like to to get the um, freehold for the for the club and the building and uh, have everything like outright in their name. So that's that's a great opportunity for them. So okay. Un- understandably, they would they want to throw their money at that, which is in fact they're doing some fundraising for that. So uh, oh, yeah, I'm going to do an, I'm going down to do an exhibition again. Hopefully this well I was hopefully going to be doing an exhibition with Cam this summer. But, um, oh mate, that would have been sick. Yeah, just a bit of a fundraiser for the club, try and build up the coffers. To um, I'm a bit worried. I'm a bit worried about the world championship race. About the race. Mm, I just don't know what's going to happen with Corona. I think they might have to. I would, right? I'd just bin the race, start again. Why? Well, because we're going to miss like I. I can't see the British Open happening, or the or the French or the RTPA. Yeah, but you've still got next year as well. Yeah, but so what do you do? Do you just remove those points from the race or do you what do you do i just don't think it's well, fair i think you basically turn around and say that in a year anything could make you have no world race points in a year you can qualify for the world championship well this is my thinking yeah so i think you just kind of say everyone's in the same boat yeah. i think if no more tournaments happen between now and the end of 2021 then that would be a bit harsh. But even then, well, the, pe- the top four people in the race are still like four of the top six or seven players in the world. So you'd have, you know, you'd have yeah. good players, didn't it? I'm a bit worried, though, about the French and stuff. I just don't know if it's going to happen. Um, which oh, well. I know, yeah. Um, British Open, I mean, November? <sighs> don't know about that. Where are we now? April? Seven, seven months. You'd think, I mean, obviously when it all blows over and stuff there's going to be like some restrictions on travel and stuff like that but mate apparently uh, australia apparently australia they're going to shut the borders until january I've, i heard i heard an insight yesterday um i was talking to chappers uh, last week and yeah. they're still like, even though the club's closed they're still working full time what are they doing 
just like painting and just doing a bit of like DIY and handyman stuff and stuff like that, which is fine. And then uh, apparently they're, um, as of the end of April or something, they're going down to one or two days a week. And, like, and I kind of said to them, I was like, oh, I think they've got it the wrong way around, mate. Like, you should have been doing nothing to start with and then gradually like easing and relaxing the, like the shutdown. Well, as long as, as, long as Chappers gets to hit, that's okay. I don't, well, I don't, I don't know what the, I don't know what the deal is. Yeah, it's actually quite interesting. There's obviously a couple of people that are able to still practice and no one else is. So it'd be interesting to, um, um I said, I actually messaged Daz yesterday and I said, mate, like, if you're allowed to see people, we're hitting some balls. Like, I don't care if the club's not open, we'll play. <laughs> and he was like, yeah, maybe. One rule for you. Um, yeah, I make my own rules. Um, <laughs> but we'll see what happens. Mate, as well, I'd drive down to Leamington and stuff, just if we could just play, for God's sake, I'm so bored. Um, well, I can't do that, can I? Because I'm not employed by the club. So if the club's closed and I'm sit- and I'm in it, then... You've got, the, you've got oh, the ball. We'll climb over the fence. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm not allowed in the building if it's closed, because otherwise it looks like I'm employed. Oh, mate, you're just using the computer for... Betting, I don't know. Well, yeah. um, then, then, then I'm employed and I don't get my government grant, so this conversation needs to end immediately. Mate, it's, we're just theorising. None of this ever yeah. happened. It's not exactly. like it, it's let's, not... Go, let's go over to Morton and play as amateurs instead. Good luck with that. Um, <laughs> yeah, but we'll see what happens. I've, I've got a feeling we'll, we'll, do, we'll next do a podcast maybe on on like Saturday or Sunday, and and I think we'll have a bigger, a great, a, a clearer picture. Sorry of what's going to change because I think something will change soon. Um, well, Boris well, is going to make announcement, so we probably won't know anything differently than we do right now. I know um, it's a disaster, disaster for the game. But you're, you know, maybe you're, maybe you would have had to think about your world race. What would you do? There you go. That's what I want you to think about between now and then. What would you do with the race, assuming no tournaments happened for the rest of this year? I'm going to have a think about that, and I'll talk about it next time. I want, I want. I want two answers. I want a sensible one and I want an extreme one. Because I've already got an extreme one. <laughs> good. <laughs> um, what court are we going to talk about next week? Uh, good point. So what are we going to do? Are we going to go alphabetical or geographical? We're gonna, on the we're... basis that I can't think of the alphabet right now, we should probably go geographical. Right? Yeah, mate. So we could... Um... So from Bridport, we're either going to go... Are we going to go north up to Bristol and go work around the top that way or and head up towards Manchester and Jesmond? Or are we going to go west and go to Canford and then see Court and Petworth. Well, we've already done Manchester and you've only been to Jesmond once, so I think we'll go south. Well, so you want to go down to France? Uh, that's not in England. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> well, you can't get much more south than Bridport. It's on the coast. Well, we'll go, like, west or east or whatever. All right. We'll, we'll go, go west. We we'll can't get no court to the east. We'll go west. Right, we'll go to Canford. Fine. Perfect. Glad we got there. Um, and then west, like, we'll go into London and stuff. That's right. Well, you, you leave the geography to me. Canford next. Yeah, fine. <laughs> um, you, come up, you, you come up with your world race theories and I'll do the geography. I actually can't wait. I've got so many fucking theories about it. My grandma's, <laughs> my grandma's started to listen to this podcast as well. Right, um, so yeah, we'll see you um, We'll see you next week. And yeah, hopefully we don't get banned from Real Tennis after this Zoom call with Ivan Rolson. <laughs>